All right. Um, so the big, oh, thank you to whoever. I don't know yet. It's going to be a mystery. Um, I will find out. No, I'm not opening. This is not a, this is not a baby shower. I'm not going to open the presents in front of everyone. Um, it would be fun. Uh, so most of you know, um, some of you are, are new this year, but almost everybody knows I do 16 weeks instead of 15. So you guys know the drill. Um, I have already sent an email to your parents, um, not as detailed as the junior high one, um, but, but this is very simple. First of all, I'm not asking you to write me anything over break. No writing. Um, next, it's not next week. My, my Tuesday's a week behind you. So next Tuesday, I will do what I do here. Then Tuesday the 19th, I will do the next week. And, and so what I did, we, are, we have three, my classes have three Aquinas readings. I put the least desirable one in the middle that you guys were going to miss, knowing you guys were going to miss it. So it is just optional for you. The next week, what, whatever, it's, um, let's just do week numbers. So this week we're going over week 14. On, on December 19th, I will teach week 15. And I will upload it for you. If you want to read it and then watch that video, awesome. If you don't want to, for January 10th, do week 16. Skip a week. Does that make sense to everybody? So if you want to do that week, join me. I, I've decided not to do a host anything at my house. Last year, Christmas was just a bad time for people. Um, I might do it again because many of you came in May and we had a good time and we talked and we watched a movie or whatever. Um, uh, so I may do that again, but this is just a busy time of year. Um, so, so if if you want an extra Aquinas week, that will be available on December nineteenth or the twentieth, whenever I get it uploaded. And if you don't, just prep prep week sixteen. Um, I think that's all. Yeah, um, a couple of, couple of you have already told me that you were really interested in um, this Aquinas book. Uh, and I urge you, you know, we're only reading three sections about the same length. You know, you read about 19 pages because it's a, just a lot. It's a lot to think about. You kind of have to read it slowly to think about it. Sometimes we read things. I'm finding this out in my Aristotle that I'm reading with my teachers in my class. Um, I think I understand it, and then my teacher asks something, I'm like, shoot, I, don't know. <laughs> I didn't really understand that at all. I really thought I understood that. Um, so sometimes if you think about it a while, you think, oh, there's a nuance there that I didn't notice. Um, but I think Peter Kraft's footnotes are really helpful, and there's just a lot of interesting stuff. If you really super love it, you could upgrade and purchase the Summa of the Summa, which is six, eight hundred pages long, something like that. But edited, this is taken out of that. So it's got all of Peter Crave's footnotes and helps and everything. Um, you know, if, if you like exceedingly logical thought, you know, if that appeals to you, go for it. Um, I would lend mine to you, but I lent it to someone else and I never got it back. So it's on my Amazon wish list, the, uh, the shorter summer. Um, uh, for our art of the week, I just wanted to remind us that this is the high, <clears throat> the high Middle Ages. So sometimes people will talk, uh, we call it the Dark Ages, you know. And this might be appropriate for the time before Charlemagne, you know, the 600s, 700s. It's pretty dicey for a while. But by the year 1000, we get into what we call the High Middle Ages, and it's, it's knights and castles. It's, it's um, flowering government. It's a merchant class that's rising in the cities, right? Not everybody is a peasant or a knight in a castle. S some of them are just doing their thing, selling goods, and making a, a lot of money as merchants. Um, and they're asking for their rights, and so things are changing. And another thing, like I told you, that's changing is um, Aristotle's works came into to Europe about the year 1200. They didn't know all of these before, and they just ate them up. Um, 
This is also, a, like say 1,000 to 1,400. This is the age of, of beautiful cathedral building. This is the flowering of Gothic cathedrals. And with some of you, I talked about this when you were younger. Um, they called them Gothic, and it was not a compliment. It looks like Goths built that thing. That's hideous. That's, that's like the work of Goths. Now we think it's beautiful. Um, but you know, these new ways of, of supporting the walls with buttresses, with flying buttresses, so the walls didn't have to be so thick. They could open it up for light, for stained glass windows. And cathedrals were almost always on the same floor plan. You can see that it is in the shape of a cross. Um, this is on purpose because it's a church. Whenever they could, the apse, the place where the altar was, faced east. Faced east because Jerusalem is to the east um, if you're in Europe. Also, the sun rises in the east, and Jesus is the light of the world. So we face. So everything about these buildings was symbolic of something. Um, and so I brought in a few pictures of the most, um, you know, what we're going to do. Hmm. Okay, if you promise not to take forever looking at them, I'm going to pass it around. This is the Chartres Cathedral. Um, I'm going to give you the cathedral, and I'm going to give you guys, this is the famous rose window, and a close-up. This is actually Charlemagne being crowned in the Chartres Cathedral. So look at them, but don't. It's terrible. Look at them, but don't look at them too long. What a mean thing to say. Um, so put, put Thomas Aquinas's writings and the Divine Comedy that we're going to read after Christmas in with th this architecture, OK? This is happening at the same time. Europe is blossoming and flowering. Um, all right, I'm going to give a moment. Oh, give, this side is doing a wonderful job of passing. Oh, OK, OK. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's not a contest between the sides. I'm sorry. <laughs> Apologize. So while those pass around, I will tell you guys flat out, I do not know how much we will go over today. Because I would like to take the time to understand what's being said. And if that means we only do the first article, so be it. Um, if you desperately want to know, the, I mean, there's no, the answers are there. It's just a matter of, do you understand what he's saying? I'll do the best I can, but I would much rather really thoroughly look at one than just boom, 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 okay, leave. You know, and you kind of, sort of went over Aquinas. I'd rather not do that. Yes. Oh. Oh yeah. No. You you need you need to read it repeatedly. It re, he's like Aristotle in that respect. It's very very dense. His thought is very dense. So I like I said, I, twenty pages of this book is plenty for a week. I found this format and like these questions very helpful. Mm. Okay, that is, that is good feedback because I, I decided to do this and I wasn't sure if it would really work and have you kind of reading it in a scrambled way, but I'm glad that it worked. Sure. On the reply to objection three. On the first article? Uh, on the first page? Uh-huh. Or the second page? Is it, because it says, yeah, this is, the first page. is it on page 61 in your, in your, Oh, okay, okay, in the second row. This is the reply to objection three. Uh huh. Um, I don't know if I read this wrong, so I think I'm going to keep it. But it said, we can demonstrate uh, the existence of a Gothic cathedral. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, well, we can't actually. Uh, me and Alex both decided, like, well, there's no point. But we were both like, um, this doesn't make any sense because we can actually do this. Like, you. You may not understand what he means by essence. Um, yeah. Essence is a particular philosophical term used by Aristotle and used by the scholastics. And it means um, the very deepest substance 
that makes something what it is. So the essence of Jesse is um, unknowable by anyone but God in that sense. No one, Jesse knows it better than the rest of us, but Jesse doesn't know it completely. Only God knows it. Um, Essie, Essie, you guys know this, is the infinitive in Latin. It means to be. Sum Essie, right? So essence is, is the very deepest substance or structure, and none of us can ever really know that about God because if we did, we'd be God. Um, what we do know, and this is this, this particular objection, we do know what he does. We see his effects. And we argue back. That's, in fact, what the whole second article is about. We can argue two ways, right? I'm sorry, I'm doing this in the bad order. We'll go to first article in a minute. We can argue two ways. Sometimes we see a cause. Um, mom is mixing cookie batter. And the effect, we're pretty sure, is going to be we're going to be eating cookies later. Somebody's going to be eating cookies later. Maybe you're going to get told, those are, for, those are for the Joneses next door. Don't eat those before you know. Okay. But we could also find a plate of cookies on the table and deduce that someone baked cookies. It may be mom. It may not be mom. We might not know the, the, the mover of the cause. But the effect, the cookies, tell me somebody baked cookies somewhere. Um, so so he said, with God, that's sort of the way we are. We don't know the cause in his fullness of being. Um, the Son reveals him to us, but only in as much as we can understand it because we're finite. And I'm assuming that our power to understand will be greater in eternity, but it will never be complete. God will always be somewhat mysterious to us in his very core because we're never going to be God. The fathers, we, we read last year, they say, you, you, we, our destiny is to be divinized, they would say, theosis, but they mean we will become by grace what they have by nature. We will participate in it. We don't ever get to be God. So does that make sense, Jesse? So that's, that's what he's really saying. We can't know who God is in his complete, utter, deepest being any more than we can know another human being in their complete, utter, deepest being. Um, there's things we keep from everyone. We all are this way that we don't even know how to express. And there are things we don't understand about ourselves. Um, I am fascinated by, in the book of Revelation, it says God gives us a, and I don't, I don't think it means literally this happens, but it metaphorically means something. Gives everyone a white stone on which is written your name. This is fascinating in my whole life because I want to know my name. I don't think I know my name. You know, you all, you all do it. We all, why am I here? Why did God particularly create me? What's my job in this world? What's my name? What's my purpose? And apparently we will have that name revealed to us. But he says he gives it to each one of us. I don't know that you guys get to know my name. It says in Revelation, known just to him and God. Does the Bible talk to that? In, in Revelation. It's, I do not know chapter and verse. Okay. So if you look up white, if you Google like Revelation, white stone, something like that, it will, it will take you to the place. Um, anyway, so that's what he means. We can never know God in his essence. Um, and that is a particularly precise philosophical term. Okay. Let's, so, so this whole thing I had you read is basically three questions, right? Is it obvious, self-evident to us that God exists? Can we prove that God exists? And does God exist? These are his set of, of three questions. So his first question is, is it self-evident? Now, this is also a particularly precise logical term. Some of you are doing Logic, doing some formal logic, right? What is a self-evident statement? You just know, you see it and you know it. Um, and it can be self-evident in various ways. Uh, this triangle has three sides. 
self-evident by definition, right? Um, the whole is greater than the parts, than any part. We, if, we know the, if we know what whole means and what part means, we see this is true. This is always true. And so he wants to know, is it obvious without reasoning to us that God exists? It's just, it's just plain. Just like we see that if it's a triangle, it has three sides. Is it a God or a power above us? Um, he uses it interchangeably. Um, he's, sometimes it means the God of Revelation. Um, sometimes it does mean a higher power because he's going from Aristotle. I think, I think a higher power is evident to us. But without reasoning. You see, so, so I know, we might say I look at creation and I, I posit that there is a creator, but there is a, there is a, there's a reasoning. Do you know what I mean? It's very rapid. It's like the cookies, right? The baker of the cookies is not self-evident to me. I had to take a little mental logical jump from every and the and the missing term the missing proposition is every effect has a cause. You see? So that's different than I just it's just plain I just know it. Um, my intellect sees it without any logical. Okay, I see but Ethan had his first, but then yours. <laughs> I know, he's wonderful. For the footnote on the, for the logical expression, um, for giving us two different branches of self evidence. Oh, yes. Um, the two branches A, it is self evident in itself and to us, meaning that it's self evident to us as, as everybody. Mm -hmm. um, or it's self evident in itself, but not to us. Mm -hmm. What is itself? Does that mean to a person or to a term? You know, to you exist. Because you're here. <clears throat> Also, self-evident could be um, if I do not know the definition of the terms. So a triangle, this triangle has three sides, self-evident, but not to me if I don't know what a triangle is. Um, you see? It's still true. It's still true. It's just I don't understand that it's true because I don't have all the information necessary to make it self-evident. Does that make sense? And so obviously there are many things that are self-evident Obviously, everything is self-evident to God. Um, that, that say to angelic beings, that are n is not self-evident to us. It's not that the object being known isn't clear. It's that we don't have the capacity or the information to understand it, and so it's not evident to us. Does that make sense? Um, uh, the, the the some of the philosophers used to to um, postulate that angels. I think I've mentioned this before. Angels had m knowledge was self-evident to them. Like all knowledge is self-evident to them. All the knowledge they have um, access to, because they're not God, but everything that they have is something they know. And I'm, I, I would love to. I hope in eternity. Do you know what I mean? I don't mind learning for eternity. That sounds awesome. But I also wonder if we will reach a state where things that we have to logically reason through will suddenly become evident to us. There's, there's two ways that you can, um, that knowing something depends on. One is if the thing you want to know is knowable, but the other is, am I the sort of person who can know it? Do I have the capacity to know it? And, and both of those have to be present. It has to be a knowable thing, an evident thing, but I also have to have the, the ability for it to be evident to me. Does that have I rambled too much, or is that helpful? But Matthew was waiting. Mm. 
and so that's basically how I think about it as I see it. C.S. Lewis made a very similar argument, Matthew. He said, if there is a desire for something, the thing exists to fill the desire. He said, if we get hungry, there is food. If we get thirsty, there is drink. He said, if we have sexual desire, there is sex, there's marriage. If we have a desire to worship, universally, if we have a desire to worship a higher being, there must be something that exists that fulfills that desire. This is a, this is a valid argument. Um, and I think, I think that's what you're, the idea that you're saying. Um, I'm sorry, Kyle, you had something to say. Um, I was just uh, digging when you were one of those um, thing starts to tell how they grew up with the mm -hmm. Oh, mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. So, so self-evident increases with our maturity, doesn't it? We learn more. So, the the little the two-year-old doesn't know yet what a triangle is, maybe, and so it, triangles have three sides. This is not helpful to a, the two-year-old in any way, shape, or form. I don't I don't know what that means, but you know, by the time you learn your shapes, it doesn't take. Okay. Now, yes, I understand completely. Um, the circle has no corners. This is self-evident, but only if I know what a corner is and what a circle is. And yes, and as I grow and mature, and hopefully, I, I feel like that's our not our main job here, obviously, but one of our tasks as human beings is we increase in knowledge and wisdom, and then we more and more of these things that are hazy, we start to understand. But there's a limit, right? There's walls around it because I'm I'm mortal. I have. I have limitations that I can't ever transcend. Yeah, Ethan. So basically, his, his answer was, the, the existence of God is self-evident through the predicate that you were just discussing, but it is not self-evident through us, but it is only self-evident through itself. Yes, yes, yes. So it's a trick question in a sense, right? Is the existence of God self-evident? Um, you know, yeah, it's, it's yes, but, but we do not, not to us, kind of little not little to us. Not it is a little bit. Um, so, so um, I, I wanted to look at objection one because I thought this was kind of fun because I, I wrote it out as a syllogism for us. Oh, do I still have? I wrote down syllogism. Oh, let's see if they match. Yours might be better than mine, Ethan. Okay, so here's what I wrote for objection one. He says, uh, how about if I just say what he says instead of, because he's smarter. Um, it seems that the existence of God is self-evident. Now, those things are said to be self-evident to us, the knowledge of which is naturally implanted in us, as we can see in regard to first principles. But as Damascene says, um, the knowledge of God is naturally implanted in all. Therefore, the existence of God is self-evident. Remember, this is not Aquinas' argument. This is the objection he's going to overthrow. Yes? I've got a big Okay, you want, you, I'll, I'll, I'll copy yours down. Yeah. You write it. I'll self evident things are naturally implanted. These are long words. Okay, what's the next thing? The knowledge of God is naturally implanted. Or knowledge through the existence of God, you know. Knowledge naturally implanted. God. Okay, I'm just going to save myself um, some time. Okay, knowledge, knowledge, yeah, because we need the same term. Um, it's born AA2, which is um, um, the second figure, which is um, yeah. the predicate double figure, mm -hmm. um, and it's um, triple affirmative, um, which is an invalid form. Mm. AA2 is invalid, and here's here's the what I noticed. We have we have a middle that's undistributed, right? Yeah. Subject in universal. This is a universal, um, and uh, it's it's not distributed here. Are are naturally implanted, um, and I guess it's not distributed all self-evident things. We have two universals, A A, and 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 neither of them is is the B term is the middle term the subject, subject and universal. And sun pin, right? My book that I'm doing, do you know about the sun pin? Did they use that in your book? Um, subject in universal, predicate in negative. 
is distributed, I'm sun pen. And apparently Thomas Aquinas is represented with a blazing sun pinned on his chest. So remember Aquinas' sun pen? Um, so it's an invalid argument. So those of you who aren't doing this yet, don't, don't be fine. And, and yes, well done, Ethan. This is an invalid argument because they're not saying, they're not connecting knowledge of God and self-evidence through any middle term. What? Um, subject, subject and universal, subject universal, son, predicate in negative. Negative. Oh, you, you, sun, then universal, un, I know. Well, make up your own, Ethan. We don't like that one. Make up a better one. <laughs> oh, is it the Barbara Chellerant? Oh. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. I'm sorry. Like, half the people are like, well, who is Barbara? Okay, don't worry about it. Do you know, I, I just learned that all the, maybe you guys already learned this. I just learned this last week that, um, so if there's a, if it's the, the lady's name and it has a C anywhere in it, the one before is convertible and the M is mutation. Yes. Oh, I love it. Okay. It's brilliant. This tells you so much about medieval people. It's like, we will categorize and classify everything and get it all nice and neat. Okay. All right. Back to Aquinas. That was fun. Um, but, but yeah, so his, his reply to this basically is what we were talking about before. We know God's existence. God's existence is implanted in us, but not in its fullness. He said we know him in an inexact and confused way. Um, this goes back to what Matthew said, I feel like. Most people throughout history have known there is a higher power of some sort, but they know him in a confused and disordered way. So if we want to know him as fully as we can, we have to have revelation. God has to reveal himself to us. We can't just know it, but we can kind of know. There's parts of the fact that there is a God that we can kind of know. So in a sense, they're right, but it depends on what we mean by knowledge of God, that there is a God or that it is the God of revelation. Um, his objection to, okay, so Ethan and I, and some of us were talking about objection to, this is the famous ontological argument. Um, Peter Kreeft informs you about this in the footnotes. Here's, here's what Anselm of Canterbury said. So imagine the thing that you can't imagine that there's anything greater than. You can't imagine there's anything greater than this thing. He said, then this thing necessarily exists because existing is better than not existing. And if it were the best thing ever that you could possibly imagine, but it didn't exist, there would be something still better that you could imagine, namely that thing existing. Therefore, it exists. And Aquinas doesn't love this argument. And a lot of people do not love this argument because it sounds a little bit like a juggling trick where they they move things around on you and they argue it in a circle or something. So in his reply to objection to, he says, perhaps not everyone who hears this word God understands it to signify something than which nothing greater can be thought seeing that some have believed God to be a body. First of all, not everybody thinks of God as that way, the, the greatest thing that can ever be thought. Um, obviously, by saying that some people think God has a body, God is material, he's insinuating immaterial is better than material, you know, that spirit is better than body. Yet granted that everyone understands that by this word God, is signified something than which nothing greater can be thought. Nevertheless, it does not follow, therefore, that he understands that what the word signifies exists actually, but only that it exists mentally. Nor can it be argued that it actually exists unless it be admitted that there actually exists something than which nothing greater can be thought. And this is precisely not admitted by those who hold that God does not exist. He said, for this argument to work, you have to start with God existing, almost. There's a God, and he's the greatest thing, and the greatest thing I can think of 
is God, and so he exists. And it goes around in a circle. Anselm felt really good about this argument, unfortunately, when he came up with it. Um, but it's not, it's not the best. It's not the best argument. Here's what he said. The only way to express the sun is going in a certain direction. Mm. This is, that's very good. Yeah, Ethan. Um, something that's interesting to think about is that um, you either know it exists or not. And to prove this, you have to know that it exists or not. For it to like either exist or not, and you don't know if it exists or not, is really good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, if you believe this or not, you don't know. You don't know until you find out. That's yeah. Why it's very interesting. Yeah. Um, objection three is is sort of another. Um, syllogism form. Um, If the existence of God were demonstrated, this could only be from his effects, but his effects are not proportionate to him since he is infinite and his effects are finite. God is infinite and all-powerful. The world is not infinite. None of the effects that we see God produce are infinite, unbounded. Um, And so he says, therefore, um, uh, it's, it's, we, it, it's, um, oh, I'm, I just read the wrong one. I'm sorry. Yeah. I read uh, the wrong one. I was going to say, that doesn't match up with what I was talking about. Um, I'm so sorry. I, I bopped into a second article. I'm so sorry. Um, further, the existence of truth is self-evident. Whoever denies the existence of truth grants that truth does not exist. And if truth does not exist, then the proposition truth does not exist is true. And if there is anything true, there must be truth. But God is truth. Do you catch, do you understand what he's saying? That's the, the, you can have your truth, I can have Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. your truth, except that. And he's redefining truth. Mm. Because he's saying truth with a lowercase t, which is obviously, oh, truth? Mm-hmm. So, I like, I like it. truth with a small t, things that are true. Truth is a big, with a big t. Um, so, here's, let's look at Aquinas' refutation. The existence, and he picks it apart in his refutation, right? The existence of truth, small t truth, in general is self-evident. He just proved it. Because if you say truth does not exist, then that's true, and then you've just blown up the whole thing, then there is something that's true. Um, But the existence of a primal big T truth is not self-evident to us. We do not know that there is a person who is truth. It's a lot like the subjective. Mm, Yes. And like I said, it's another another syllogistic, you know, but in this case, as Ethan has observed, he he equivocates. He, the, the objector in this case, says truth meaning, I said a statement that's true, truth meaning there is, there is an entity who is truth, who is synonymous with truth itself. Um, so yes, so he, he says that um, uh, God, we, we cannot know God in his essence. Um, uh, and so the existence of God is not self-evident. His, on the contrary, basically um, says, I wrote down, no one can admit mentally the opposite of what is self-evident. I can't entertain the idea that the triangle doesn't have three sides. Not to be sane and completely understand what a triangle is. There'd be, there'd be a meaningless speculation. I'm speculating on the non-three-sided triangle. This is bosh. It doesn't make any sense. Um, but, but he said, Scripture says the fool denies in his heart. The fool says in his heart there is no God. There are people who mentally entertain the fact that there is no God. Therefore, it must not be self-evident because we can't entertain thoughts the opposite to something that is self-evident. Does that make sense to you guys? I can't really think about the corners of my hypothetical circle. That is nonsense. It doesn't, it's not, it doesn't exist in any... Even all of the Spider-Verse. It doesn't exist. It's not ever there. No corners in the circles. (laughs) If we can't even grasp it, it's 
because we can't even grasp impossible. it. But people can and have speculated the complete non-existence of God. <coughs> Choked myself on that Spider-Verse comment. It's my punishment. <laughs> okay. Does that make sense to everybody? This first article? No. That doesn't make sense to me either. I only watch them because of Benedict Cumberbatch. Um, uh, he's awesome. Always. Um, so, so he says, no, God's existence as deep as it is not self-evident to us, which opens up the, the door for his second question. Can we prove that God exists? This is what he means by demonstrate. Remember, this is a demonstration, what we just wrote on the board. Demonstrate doesn't mean I hypothesize. It doesn't mean I'm opining. I think maybe it might be true. We had a little conversation, and we came to this conclusion. This is demonstrate. From premises that come before, can we logically demonstrate that God exists? And his, go straight to his, on the contrary, God, yes, God is demonstrated through what he made. But to know him this way, we must first be able to demonstrate that he exists. Because non-existent things don't have any effects, right? Um, so here, let me say that in a different way. I already mentioned that he, he talks about two ways to prove something. Remember the cookies and the baker, right? Your mom's making cookies, your, your mom's mixing dough, there will be cookies, or there are cookies on the table, somebody baked cookies. So these are two ways we reason. Is we, we have to reason um, the second way with God. So we can't know him directly, we can't have direct knowledge of God unmitigated through the, the son who is also God I realize but it's it's also mitigated by the fact that we just can't handle it we can't handle the truth um, we can't see the light it's blinding to us um, so but if we're going to demonstrate that mom made cookies because there are cookies on the table we pretty much have to assume that mom exists or bakers a baker somewhere exists and so, he, do you see, there's two steps he's taken. He's saying, can we prove that God exists? Well, we can see he did things. So we get back to the someone did it, therefore the someone exists. You see, there's, there's actually a, a, a middle step there. I mean, mentally, we don't really question that mom exists and, or that a baker exists. But technically, your mind went through a little jump. Right? Somebody did this so that something exists. And we just plow through it. But he doesn't plow through anything. He has to take every step. Yes? It was so important to define this in terms of demonstration. Mm. Really, it's pretty boring. Because, like, you look at the terms and I'm just like, oh, these footnotes are so good. That, this these is why I said read the footnotes. Just, it's amazing. come to the conclusion which is a lot of modern apologetics isn't it when we when we argue um, through creation you know um, we're, we're arguing that way that somebody made all of this I should bring in I have this amazing little book do you guys know who William Steig is he wrote Shrek he wrote the original Shrek but he wrote a bunch of children's picture books he wrote some longer books too my kids used to just love William Steig books they're just Alexa uh, Sylvester and the Magic Pebble does anybody know Celestia the Magic Pebble? Okay. Anyway, yeah, he, that's the, one about the, donkey. the donkey that turned into the rock. Exactly. Okay. So William Sog. And he wrote this book called Yellow and Pink. And I should have brought it today because that would have been awesome. Um, it's very simple. There's pictures. There's hardly any words. It's very profound. And basically, these two dolls wake up and one's yellow and one's pink. All right. And one of them, they check each other out and like, oh. 
um, you're pretty awesome. I'm pretty awesome. I think somebody made us. And the other one says, yeah, n no, I, I think we just happen. And he's like, well, how, how would that? And he says, well, you know, I think, see, we're wood. And I'm pretty sure, you know, lightning could strike a tree. And it could break off pieces of the tree. And it was shaped like us. And the guy says, well, how did we get painted? He's like, well, you know, somebody could spill paint on the hill. And we just rolled down the hill. We rolled in the paint. And so they go through all every step. And how did we get these little eyes? And these guys got an explanation for how it just chance, chance. And then the end of the book, um, it says, the dolls are laying there on the newspaper, or whatever. The craftsman came out of his workshop and picked them both up. Nice and dry, he said. And he tucked them under his arm and walked away. And that's the end of the book. And, and so, you know, the one, I don't remember which yellow or pink, um, argues there is no cause, basically. Or the cause is random chance that just happened. Um, and this is not a very, re it's not any more reasonable for the world than it is for yellow or pink to say, I'm a doll with jointed limbs painted with little eyes and I just happened by chance when lightning hit a tree and broke a branch off and I rolled down a hill. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. So, so this is a powerful, this is a powerful tool simply because we don't know God in his essence, but we are surrounded by his effects. So in the Eastern Orthodox Church, they have this idea of um, like God's essence and his energies, they call it. So um, miracles, the things, all the effects are what they've called the, the energies of God. It, we, would, we would say the effects. Um, it's sort of like um, you can feel the heat of the sun, but you can't look directly into the sun because you'll burn your eyes out. But you can, you can look, you know, you can watch an eclipse through the various, you know, with the construction paper, and you build your little thing in your box, and you can see the eclipse. Or, <clears throat> or you can close your eyes, and you, you know how you can kind of see the sun? The, you can see the light through your closed eyes, those the energies. But to look directly at the sun or walk on the sun and explore the sun, not going to happen. And that's how the Eastern Church sort of describes this whole effect and essence. Um, so the objections. Objection one. Let me go to the right page this time. It seems that the existence of God cannot be demonstrated, for it is an article of faith that God exists. But what is of faith cannot be demonstrated because a demonstration produces scientific knowledge. Be careful here. He doesn't mean what you think he means. He doesn't mean biology or chemistry. He means 100% sure. If this is scientific knowledge, when you demonstrate and you've decided that it's valid or not valid, that's scientific knowledge. Scio, right? Scientia in Latin, I know, I know. So it doesn't mean, whenever you hear Aquinas say scientific knowledge, he means 100% sure it's been logically demonstrated in a valid syllogism. He doesn't mean biology or chemistry or, okay. So yeah, no, no, that's not what he means. Because for modern readers, like scientific, no, I don't know if we're doing God's biology here. Um, that's not what he means. Um, so he says, a demonstration produces scientific knowledge. Whereas faith is of the unseen. Therefore, it cannot be demonstrated that God exists. Now, in my opinion, this is something we hear today a lot. Well, um, you know, it's faith versus reason, right? It's faith versus science. But when they say it, they mean biology and chemistry and things. They don't mean like this. Um, so I feel like this is what the world is throwing at us right now. Well, that's, that's faith. You, you believe that. That's true for you. You just believe that on faith. You bl blind faith. Um, if you haven't been accused of these things or heard Christians be accused, you will be. You will hear it. Because the world treats faith as completely divided from all actual knowledge. Right? It's over here in this realm. You can't prove it. You can't prove anything over here. Well, now let's see what Aquinas has to say in answer to this. Yes. Go ahead. Say you believe 
touch it on both types. Both that they have to do it immediately with saying, oh, you must be wrong about it. Yes. That. Yes. Because you have no you have no basis for what you believe, in other words. That's what they're thinking. If you're an orthodox well, technicality, but it's just like proving well it can't not exist, so mm. it must like you don't you don't have enough evidence to prove it, so it must be false. Yes. Um, I'm going to go around this way. Yeah, Matthew. Indeed. Indeed. Almost every almost everything we do at all the time is based on faith in someone or something. Faith in gravity, right? Yeah. I have faith in the builders of the seventy four bridge. You know, that I'm gonna make it back to Illinois this afternoon. <laughs> um, you know, I have faith, you know, that, that things I eat and drink are safe for me. You know, you go to a restaurant, you have utter faith that they've prepared you something that's not gonna make you ill or it, you, we operate on faith. I love history. I only know this through faith in my sources. I wasn't there. I never saw any of this stuff happen. I take it on, a, on authority. I have faith in them. So this is very well said. And you said that's what you were going to say as well. Did you have something else to say? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Let's, exactly. let's see what Thomas Aquinas says about this. He is reply to objection one. Um, am I at the right place? Okay. The existence of God and other like truths about God which can be known by natural reason are not articles of faith, but are preambles to the articles. For faith presupposes natural knowledge, even as grace presupposes nature, and perfection supposes something that can be perfected. We believe because it is reasonable. But the things that are articles of faith are the things that we could never reason out. Jesus is God. Well, I even, I might go from his effects in that case to the cause. He did do all sorts of miracles and then he came alive again. It's a pretty big effect. Um, uh, Trinity. How about we use that one? I don't think we could ever in a million years reason out that God is one in three persons. That, in fact, that's so not reasonable out that we don't even understand what that means, honestly. Um, we try. We try. And there's nothing wrong with the trying. Um, but, um, but there's a baseline on which our faith is based, and it is that the existence of God is quite reasonable. And um, as Matthew said, you know, we, we have faith in, if you have faith in Charles Darwin, you have faith because you believe his credentials and his research are valid. Well, if we have faith that God exists, we, we, have, we have faith in the evidence, right? Okay, so Rhett wanted to say something. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Rhett. So the argument that it's that the Trinity is super hard to understand because um, it says it's one in three and that they were so crazy, it makes sense, but we're also forgetting the fact that it's one in three and what else do we think that's one in three? Parts of a whole. Yeah. One pizza, and I'm using C.S. Lewis, um, mm -hmm. C.S. Lewis is bad, we don't let him in. <laughs> you, take one, you take one, okay, you take an Oreo, okay, or a pack of Oreos, um, you eat you you eat half of an Oreo. That half of the Oreo is still the same Oreo, it's made of the same, same material as the other half of the Oreo and the wholeness of the Oreo. Mm -hmm. It still has its full Oreo-ness, mm -hmm. which is the same as God. They take, well, they're different. They can be, they're not going to be split symmetrically. Yeah. But they're still the same. Because analogies are never going to be perfect, right? It's hard to have a perfect analogy, but analogies very much help. And we do have analogous, um, uh, an analogous uh, examples. Augustine named a lot of those. Okay, Rhett has remembered. Um, Maybe. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Although, you know, there are many now scientific, and I mean this in the modern sense, things that, that don't m make complete sense on the surface anymore, as, as we've had all sorts of weird physics since Einstein. Do you know what I mean? Things that are really hard to wrap your head around. And likewise, there's a certain level of acceptance there, I feel like, in faith. As you, 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 you know, you're going to test black holes or whatever. You know, you have a certain belief that they exist, because of certain effects you've seen, you know, but you, you're, you're, you're stepping out on the belief that this thing exists, this thing I can't perceive with senses exists, and therefore now I'm going to set out to explore more about it and, and its, uh, its properties. And we can't understand infinity because we are finite. Um, oh, yeah, Jesse. Mm. Oh. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, this is a complete digression, and I've probably told you this before, but if so, you can just say, yeah, we know, Mrs. Ferguson, move along. Um, <laughs> you can say it nicer than that, but you can say that. Um, in, throughout history, up until Oh, several, the past several hundred years. The reason for studying math was never, ever, ever because it was useful. Um, I, I, so the, the when, I, when am I going to use this is a nonsense question in that respect. The study of math was because it opened your mind to things that are not sensible and tangible and, and experienced experienced, uh, experienceable with, with our bodies. So in other words, um, you know, three doesn't exist. Um, the digit three exists, and I can write it on the board. I can have three things, but the concept of threeness is not existing anywhere in the world. It is a mental concept. Um, you, the circle you construct in geometry is only being represented on the paper. It's an imperfect representation of what an actual circle is. And this is not exist. I know this is a very weird thing to say. It does not exist that perfection. It is a, it is a concept to which all circles belong. This should sound very much like Plato, a little bit like Plato, because it is. I mean, he has some legitimate observations. And so um, the, the ancients and the medievals thought that training in the liberal arts, geometry, arithmetic, astronomy, trained you. They had no, medieval astronomers didn't care, early medieval astronomers, ancient astronomers, particularly they didn't care how the planets actually moved. I mean, they did know, but the idea was they were looking at something that transcended the senses. They were much more interested in the math of astronomical motion than the observation of astronomical motion. That came later. And so all those things you learn, when you learn the liberal arts, they weren't ever intended to be useful. They were intended to change your mind, to give you a different sort of mind. And they said, this prepares someone to study philosophy and theology, the highest things that we can ever ask. Who am I? What is man? Why am I here? And who is God? What is my relationship to him? The high, oh, I'm so sorry. That's, the X-Files is playing um, terribly, terribly sorry. Go, go away. It makes my life seem more exciting if sometimes the X-Files plays. Um, it makes me feel like I'm edgy and <laughs> tracking down conspiracies. Um, um, <laughs> I'm totally off. The, okay, let's, I did not read all of objection, reply to objection one. First of all, he said, um, so he said, faith, is based on something we can actually know. Nevertheless, 
There is nothing to prevent a man who cannot grasp a proof, accepting as a matter of faith, something which in itself is capable of being scientifically known and demonstrated. We all aren't trained or smart enough to follow every argument. I'm pretty sure the smartest person in the world, there are arguments that person is not going to be able to follow because we're all finite, right? So if I can't understand the syllogism, either because I have not been trained in logic or, or I just um, don't have the capacity. We're not very fond of saying that, but we all have different capacities, right? God is gracious. We don't have to be able to reason it out. God shows us everything that is required for our salvation. Oh, this is just the most exciting class ever. <laughs> Sorry, it's okay. Um, we don't have to reason everything out. But there are things we can reason out if we have the ability. Okay. Um, okay, objection two. This was kind of hard. He talks about the fact that um, essence is the middle term in the demonstration. And we talked about middle term. But we cannot know God's essence. And as you guys know, those of you doing logic, you know the middle term is super duper duper important because it is the thing that connects the, the major and minor terms, right? If there's no proper connection, there's no syllogism. There's no, nothing we can demonstrate from this. And he said, if the being is, is the middle, how can we connect it? Well, he, th the footnote was very helpful here. He says, mm, reply to objection to, when the existence of a cause is demonstrated from an effect, and we already said this is how we have to do God. Are you guys with me? Um, we have to do it that way because we can't know God's essence and reason to it directly. So we have to look at his effects. It's an a posteriori argument. When we do that, the effect takes the place of the definition of the cause in the proof of God's existence. He says the effect becomes the middle term, linking us with um, the existence. So I, I drew this in my book. Um, so I'm not even sure if I drew this right, okay? I'm not totally comfortable with this. So we have feet. And the feet, this is the effect, footprints. And then we can go out to the, the, um, the walker, all right, the, the, the feet of someone. That the effect, yeah, that, that um, I, but I'm not sure I, I love that, but I don't know how else to draw it. If the footprints are the middle term, if the effect is the middle term connecting, I'm not sure that it shouldn't be feet here and walker here. Depends on which direction we're reasoning. So his, his that he used, what did he use? Yeah, I've... Okay, okay. Yes, I like that. All, it, because that connects them. All feet leave footprints. All footprints indicate a walker. So that would be, that would be right. That would be the effect leading us out to the cause. Um, so he's saying we don't need to know the essence of God as a middle term. We don't have to know that because it's not that sort of demonstration. We are demonstrating backwards from an effect as he already told us, and not um, forwards um, from the cause. Um, what did I do with my list? All right, objection three. Oh, this is the one we were, I think Ethan was talking about this earlier. If the existence of God were demonstrated, it could only be from his effects, which we said. His effects Oh, was I talking about that? His effects are not proportionate to him. He is infinite and his effects are finite. 
And between the finite and infinite, there can be no proportion. Therefore, since a cause cannot be demonstrated by an effect not proportionate to it, it seems that the existence of God cannot be demonstrated. Cre creation is limited. Creation is finite. Creation um, decays. Creation will eventually pass away, although that's something we can only know through revelation, I think, and not through reason. Um, is, is the door locked? Is, oh. Come on in. No. I, do you know where Trish is? She will lead you. Um, makes me want to be in on the lunch. Um, uh, oh, okay, Ethan hates this argument. He's going to tell us why. <laughs> because basically he's jumping from an existence to essence. This mm. argument is okay. that we keep that, that since we can't know his full essence because it's infinite and we're not infinite, we're finite, therefore we there, therefore God's existence can't be demonstrated. Mm -hmm. We're mm -hmm. talking about his existence here, not mm -hmm. essence. Mm -hmm. his, his existing cannot, is not, has nothing to do with And this essence. is exactly, Ethan, what Aquinas says. Listen to his reply to this. From effects not proportionate to the cause, no perfect knowledge can be obtained. We can't know the essence. Yet, from every effect, the existence of the cause can be clearly demonstrated the existence of the cause. So we can demonstrate the existence of God from his effects, though from them we cannot perfectly know God as he is in his essence. The cookies tell you there is a baker. They do not tell you anything about the baker. You do not know if the baker is young or old. You do not know if it is male or female. You, you, you surmise that it is human. Dogs don't do a lot of baking. If your dog does any baking, I would like to hear about that first. Second of all, you should call someone and get on television with that dog. Um, so there are things that I can deduce from the existence, but there are things I cannot until I meet the baker face to face. And even then, I will not know the deepest, darkest secrets of the baker in the baker's secret recesses of his or her heart, I will only know more, more about the baker. Um, so the existence, do you guys all follow that? Because it seems really important to Thomas Aquinas. Existence and essence are just two very different things. And there are many ways to prove the existence of things that we can never know the core substance, the thing that makes it that thing and no other entity in the universe. That that we don't have access to. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Very good. A absolutely. Absolutely. That it is, exists, but we can't know more than its existence. But, but knowing that that essence exists is something. It is real knowledge. It is true knowledge. Carson, were you going to say something? Mm -hmm. of that line, but you're never going to know the whole thing because you're finite. You, yes. I mean, you can count as high as you want to, but you're never going to reach infinity because you can't. You can't. Um, I wonder, this is just me thinking out loud now, um, if as human beings, many of us are not comfortable with that situation, that um, the lack of complete knowledge, I think because we were created to know. We, all of us, but some, to a greater or lesser extent, have a pain in our hearts or our minds 
that we can't, that there are things we can't know. Um, and because I have the desire to know, I'm assuming that that desire will be fulfilled, like we were talking the C.S. Lewis argument, someday, um, realizing that I can't ever be omniscient. Um, but anyway, I, I want to know, therefore, there is knowledge. That's another hunger that can be filled. But, um, but you know, we, we talk about these things, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's hard, maybe, for us as human beings to know there are things we will never fully know. It's hard for me. I, mean, I should just talk for myself, but I don't think I'm alone. I think that it's the human condition that we just have this understanding that there are things we will never know and understand. But because we're made to be more than we are in a fallen world, it hurts us. It causes us pain. Yeah, right. I'm going to guess, Rhett, so next year, you know, God willing, and we're all here and doing the modern year, um, we will read Descartes, all right, and, and starting with Descartes, there's this idea, you know, you know the famous, I think, therefore I am, you know, that I'm somehow separate from all sensory experience. After Francis Bacon and Descartes, the, the scientific revolution, all right, we want to know we want to know like that. We want to be, have everything demonstrated. We want to be sure. Descartes said, I want to know everything like I know math. I want every experience to be like my experience of math. He didn't say those words exactly, but that's the gist of it. All things that are worth knowing can be known with the 100% certainty with which we work out a mathematical equation or a geometric proof. And I'm sorry, Mr. Descartes, no. I mean, you're super smart, smarter than me and everything, but no. We, and Francis Bacon, no, we can't. There are things that we can't. And so what, once you get that mindset, Rhett, you know, like everything's got to be that way. Well, so this is its own little syllogism. Everything must be 100% scientific knowledge. Knowledge of God and creation cannot be 100% knowledge. Therefore, we don't need knowledge of God and creation. You know, we can just, we can just go our merry way. That's not pro probably an invalid syllogism. I just threw it together. But that's the line of thinking that takes place, I think. And, that, and I think that's a good observation that, that discomfort, but it might not be personal discomfort, like it makes me uneasy. It might be intellectual discomfort. I can't prove it. 100% like I can prove that, you know, X is 32 or, you know, that these angles are equal or something like that. Um, and therefore, therefore, I reject the things that I can't. But the odd thing is that then evolution itself takes various premises that themselves cannot be proven. They're, they're taking a baseline, for example, you know, when they date, they, they date rocks, rock strata by, by uh, decay methods. Well, they've made an assumption about how much of each isotope was in the rock at the beginning. They don't know. They have no idea what it was created to be at the beginning. They said, oh, it was all this. What, did you get a time machine? What, did you visit creation? What, did you get core samples from day one? I missed that part. Um, they don't know. They have also made assumptions that they are accepting on, on faith. And Matthew was saying something very similar earlier. Um, OK, we have 15 minutes. We're going to dive into whether God exists. In 15 minutes, we're going to prove that God exists. Wow. We're so smart. Yes. <laughs> In the beginning. Well, here's what I love. So Thomas Aquinas, this is a misunderstanding about the Middle Ages. People say, because the medievals loved their books, I mean, they super loved their books. Um, and they said, oh, they're only just blindly following authorities and books. OK, so far, we haven't actually read any authority from a, a, well, John of Damascene, John of Damascus, it said he said this as support of something. But in general, the medievals and Aquinas considered the, the argument from authority the weakest argument. 
This is a, this is a mistake. Like the argument from authority is the weakest argument. But it depends on the authority, and I love this, whether God exists. On the contrary, God said, I am who I am. Boom. This is all we need. God said, I exist. I love this. Um, then this article unravels into, well, there's only five proofs of God's existence, but Mr. Kreeft puts, I don't know how many in the footnotes. I hope you will. There's multiple pages. Yeah, they're not even numbered really, so we can't really go through them. I hope that you will go through them. Um, some of them are modern, more modern arguments. C.S. Lewis is in there. Um, they are amazing. Oh, 24. 24, a brief summary of 24 arguments for God's existence. I love it. But Aquinas just use, goes with five. And let's talk about his five. Um, I may not be able to read all of them because they're, they're not separated from each other in his, you know, well, it says uh, the paragraph starts with the first. The first and most manifest way is the argument from motion. Would someone like to just super short, th this is very long, but what's the basic argument from motion? Alex had his hand up first. This Sorry. Oh, I don't know. I have to put my bless. Um, I, he, Aquinas' starts on 58, his description of, of one. Uh, cosmological, which one? A, cosmological A. Yes, it is. Yeah. So he summarizes all of them for us quite well, nicely. Isn't it that um, so like energy cannot be created or destroyed? And so something must have given energy into the universe in order for it to emit no Yes. Basically, yes. If something moves, there's a mover. They call it the unmoved. The unmoved mover. This is what Aristotle called him. Um, Aristotle coined this. Um, Aristotle reasoned that far. His God was not anything like the God of Revelation of the Bible, but he did. But it wasn't Zeus. You know, I mean, it was a legitimate higher power. And he said, he said things are in motion, and he doesn't necessarily mean things are moving. I mean, some like growth and decay can be in motion. Things here are changeable, right? But there must be something, and Carson said it very nicely, that put energy into that to create the motion. So this is the fun thing when we read the Divine Comedy. Uh, um, it's, this is the medieval, this is how medievals saw the, the solar system, okay? You probably know this. The Earth is in the middle, and then every, uh, everything else is on a sphere. So a, a ball, all right? So it's like Russian nesting dolls, right? So, so the Earth's in the middle, and then you have the moon sphere, and then I don't know what came next, like the Venus sphere, the Mars sphere, the Jupiter sphere. You, you go out, and each one, and it's there, each sphere is moving in its own way. And then you get out, and you get to, out to the, the stellatum, where the stars are, and then outside of it, the, the, the sphere that's bigger is the primum mobile, the first mover. And so, you know how little kids have toys um, and they've got like wheels inside wheels and stuff and you roll it and then everything inside starts rolling? Do you know what kind of toy I mean? Um, it's like that. And so God moves the prima mobile and the motion of that sets all the other spheres in motion and they have a special way of motion and astronomers would would chart the ways of the motion. Where so, oh, it's on a sphere too. It's had some sphere. I left the sun out. The sun's apparently not important. Um, and so in the paradise, Dante goes through the spheres up to the prima mobile, to the Empyrean. This is where God is. Um, and so he gets to visit each sphere. He gets, and so that's how paradise, that's how the poem part of, uh, the part of Divine Comedy called Paradise is. So there's a, oh, I've told you guys this before. Oh, it's, this is my father's world, the hymn. This is my father's world, and blah, 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 blah. I don't remember. Um, the 
heaven rings, it sings, and round me rings the music of the spheres. The, they make music. Oh, yeah. The music of the spheres. They make music that we can't hear because of our fallen nature and our distance from God, but the angels can hear it. I have no idea why I gave that talk on the dream. Oh, I guess because motion, okay. It was fun though, wasn't it? Um, motion, so the, this motion on the outside. So this is reason number one. We, the solar system is in motion. Our world is a world of change. In fact, the medievals saw that world outside the moon sphere as unchanging and perfect. So the medieval poets often talk about in this place under the moon. They're like, what's up with the moon? It means everything under the moon sphere is decaying, changeable, problematic, is sinful, is subject to sin. But beyond that, they thought all of the orbits were perfect spheres, perfect circles. Now we know they're ellipses, and you know we know many other things scientifically. But um, that we were in a realm of change. OK, anyway. I, beat that to death. Um, okay. <laughs> Proof number two. Do it. Great. Every effect has a cause. Aristotle mapped out four different causes that everything can exist. And I think that you guys probably learned this. So I don't know. Um, no, so, it's senior year. oh, is it senior year? Okay, well, it's your lucky day because we're going to do it now. So, the material cause of something is what it's made of. So, let's do a house, okay? The material cause of a house is like wood and glass and nails and you know stuff like that. And then the um, for formal cause is its shape. Like a house has walls and, 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 and a, a roof and doors and windows and things like that. Um, the efficient cause is what Ethan was talking about. It's uh, the uh, who, who made it. Right, so the official cause is the is the I don't know the, like the construction company or the architect or whatever. The final cause is is uh, what's it for? And and a house is for living in. It's for sheltering you from the elements and giving you a place to put your stuff. And so, and Aristotle said we can't really know a thing completely until we know all of these. He said to know something we really should know. You know, that, um, you know, this book is made of paper. It um, is, was written by Aquinas and edited by Kraft. Um, it's, it's a rectangle. And, and it's for knowledge. It's for gaining knowledge. And then I've sort of exhaustively told you about this, this thing. So he's concentrating on one of those, right? The who. We don't need to know. This is important. We don't need to know the material, the former or the final causes to know that the cause exists, right? We can just see it from the effect. We know there's an efficient cause. We might not know who it is. We know, know a lot about that baker, but we do know that the baker exists. Um, okay. Proof, ooh, we got six minutes. <laughs> Proof number three. This one's a little harder. I feel like this one's a little harder. Would somebody like to try their hand at it, or would you like to hear my summary? OK. This is why it's kind of long, and because of time constraints, I'm just going to read my summary. 
Nature is full of things that might or could not exist. Like those things could not exist. I don't feel like our lives would be horrible if, I mean, look, they're fine, they're pretty and everything, but you know what I mean? They're expendable. Like it could not exist. I'm sorry. They're lovely. I apologize to the church. Like they're lovely, but they could, it's possible that they could not exist. Um, given this, there could have been a time when nothing existed, given infinite time, all right? If everything were something that might exist or might not exist, it is conceivable there could be a time when all of that would converge and nothing would exist. This is the part that's a little hard to follow. But if so, how could things begin to exist if nothing existed? You see, if, if the world, all right, so everything in this room might not exist. I might not have existed. Okay, but if we all, if all of that converged at one point and no, nothing in this room existed, how could something start existing in this room unless there were something existing outside this room that brought stuff in, right? If something existed outside this room and brought it in, there must exist somewhere something whose existence is necessary, that has to exist, or else we wouldn't. Yeah, then it is necessary. So they've traced it back also to something that has, philosophers call it this, some things are contingent. It means they might not exist. They rely on something else for their existence, and some things are necessary. And, and his argument here is that it's conceivable that nothing might exist, because everything we see could exist or could not exist. This stool could not exist. This water bottle could not exist. But what if we wiped out all of that? Where is the thing that made everything exist? It's kind of related to the, the effect, right, one, but it's not exactly the same as the effect argument. I think that, that one's pretty hard. Um, argument four. Um, this is the one that Matthew was hinting at earlier, I believe. Um, all beings, and he doesn't mean animate beings, like everything that exists, is more or less good, more or less noble, more or less beautiful. We, we rate the quality of things. But what's the scale we rate it on? The, the fact that something the best exists. Something perfect must exist. And, and I like the way he ends it. And this is the thing that most people call God. That's the ending of every, and this is the thing that we call God. Um, yes. Um, all right. His last one, actually, I'm glad I put this up here. I didn't realize this. His last one argues from final cause. My summary is, um, all things act towards an end. Um, when you read philosophy, either in this book or later, beware of the word end. Um, because for us, it means the finish. But for them, the end of something is what it's for. The end of a house is to be lived in by a family. It, the, the end of a house is also you know, like a tornado or a, <laughs> a flood or a fire. But it's a different kind of end, okay? When philosophers, when medieval philosophers say it is the end of this thing, they don't mean it's done. They mean this is what it's for. So if, if we see things always act towards a purpose, the medievals were big on everything has a purpose. Everything has a purpose. Everything has a final cause then some intelligent being must be directing that end, right? Racers don't run just randomly. They run a course set out for some, by someone else for them. And there's the red tape at the finish line. Someone else said, this is the goal. This is the goal. So <clears throat> the medievals had this fun idea. And it's going to sound silly to you, but if you think about it a little bit, maybe you'll like it. Um, of course, they did not understand the mathematics of gravity. 
this waited for Newton, you know. But they understood, obviously, that things fall. You don't have to be brilliant to see that you draw things and they always fall. But they had a different idea of it. We kind of think of it as the force, you know, it's the, the force. Nobody really knows what gravity is. Like we can mathematically calculate it, but what, what, what's the deal? What, what, why do things of greater mass pull on things? Like that's just weird. Nobody really knows the essence of gravity, right? It's, it's, <coughs> But we don't, we don't know why. We don't, it's, it's weird, we don't know it's the essence. So anyway, so the medievals saw this happen. And instead of saying, we are going to mathematically calculate the gravitational pull, they said, everything goes to the place it wants to go. And by wanting, they didn't mean, they didn't think that rocks were sentient. These are not stupid. I hope that you read this and you don't think these are stupid people, okay? They don't think they don't think rocks are like, oh, yay, I get to go to the ground now. I've always wanted to go to the ground. <sighs> no. Um, but they but they had an idea that fire flames go up because it's their nature. And heavy things fall because of their nature. And one medieval author called it, I think it was Chaucer, called it kindly inclining towards the place it wants to be. This is a much more friendly universe to me than, you know, than calculating gravity. It's like, oh, I just, it just wants, it wants to go. When I trip over a rock, I want to fall on the ground, apparently. Yes, Matthew. Oh. I feel like the medievals would love this comment, Matthew. Yeah, Ethan. Um, this is actually true. This is true. Um, we know scientifically that as everything draws closer to the center of the Earth and its gravitational mm -hmm, mm -hmm. force, it's, and, I mean, and it's, you know, I mean, it's, I mean, but we're pointing at everything else. Yeah. Oh, it's fine. Yes. So you're going to see, though, that they're totally realists as far as gravity and things go. When Dante, in the Divine Comedy, ends up at the center of the earth, I'm not going to tell you what's at the center of the earth. You'll have to wait and read it. But when he climbs through the center, down becomes up. When he hits the midpoint, he like says, well, I thought we were climbing down. Why are we climbing up? And his guide says, well, this is because we've passed the center of the earth and everything is down towards the center of the earth. And now we were climbing down, but now we're climbing up because we're on the other side of the middle of the earth. It's very... Wait, so they knew that the world wasn't flat? Oh, th this is, okay, leave here with this. Practically no one since the ancient world has thought the world was flat. That is a big, big misconception. The Greeks proved it was round. Sailors knew it was round because they could see boats over the horizon. Everybody, every intelligent person believed the world was round. This was not, I mean, I'm not saying nobody thought there was an edge of the earth, but it. this was not the accepted belief. So, oh yeah. They go, yeah, and they speculated on who's on the other side, the people on the other side of the world. They thought, we can't ever meet them. Here's why, because there's five areas of the world, the two cold places. There's our land mass and whatever land mass is on the other side of us and desert, heat. We can't get through the heat. So if there are people, the Antipodes, it's called. Like we're here and these are the Antipodes people. Their feet are facing our feet. They're like China for us or whatever. We can't ever meet them because of desert. We can't. So if they're there, um, in the Divine Comedy, you will find out there is, well, you will find out what's at the Antipodes. It's a surprise. OK, yeah. Yeah. And people trickled down to mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. and they all just knew that 
it's yeah. It, and, and it's and it's a demonstrable thing. It's a scientific. Okay, so you guys apparently have food waiting for you. Have a wonderful Christmas. Uh, you want to come to lunch? Join me to on. Lunch? Well, I didn't bring anything, Kyle. Oh, can I have a piece? Oh, I would love a piece. Okay, I am hungry.